Nosferu is a supernatural hero that is a cross between the Shadow, Peter Cushing's Abraham Van Helsing, and Lovecraft's Henry Armitage. The lone surviving member of the secret holy order, he is sworn to battle a cult of vampires dedicated to opening the door to the eldritch gods they worship. Striking from his crypt lair deep within an impenetrable mire, Nosferu collects the cult's various grimoire and artifacts in an attempt to learn the means of defeating them. Nosferu underwent the ritualistic binding to the spirit world, wherein members of the secret order have a shard from a holy sword driven through their noses to allow them to access supernatural abilities. One such ability allows Nosferu to summon Phantomus, a giant phantom hound that can travel through the neither to and from any location when needed. With no worldly attachments beyond his devotion to God, Nosferu's world is forever changed when he rescues a beautiful young maiden named Laurel from one of the cult's vile, sacrificial rituals. Nosferu the Cryptwalker Volume 1 is my third Indiegogo campaign and will be a fully painted and lavishly illustrated pulp adventure story. Sensational, vivid, and uncompromisingly aspirational storytelling with an edge. Don't miss your chance to back Nosferu the Cryptwalker Volume 1, available for a limited time only on Indiegogo. Hey, what's up, Stephen Rockwood? How you doing, brother? Hope you're having a good morning. I am uh, here at work streaming. What's up, Aaron? Good to see you guys. It's been a minute. Been uh, working. Let me see if I can get this camera at a better angle here. Um, I've been working like crazy on this book and doing all kinds of stuff. Let me turn the volume down on that. The sound effects are diabolical here. There we go. That's a little bit better. But how to yourself, Aaron? Good to see you. I'm a whack ass. Yo, yo, guys. How are you? Look at this crew. What a great crew you guys are. So, yeah, so I've been working on, um, working on Nosferu, getting a bunch of different things set up for it, and, um, wanted to check in and say, hey, guys, and thank you, guys. We've hit some huge milestones. I've been jumping on a bunch of different chats, and I want to say, again, thank you guys for backing this book. My wife and I have been, uh, Spent a lot of time talking about our gratitude for everybody's support. And uh, I wanted to, you know, share with you guys uh, more work, what I've been up to. And I've uh, been trying to keep everything, you know, my posts and things on Twitter pretty regular so you guys can see it. But uh, I hope everybody's having a good morning. Hail the chat, hail Comicsgate. What's up, y'all? Let's see what we've got here. <laughs> you guys are awesome. So yeah, so I'm working on uh, on a pretty pretty big page for me, um, in terms of the story and in terms of uh, you know setting up what this world's about and what we're doing here with it. And um, this is kind of where uh, Laurel, our our female lead, kind of starts to get a glimpse of what Nosferu is about, what he's wrestling with. It's kind of our first glimpse into the character, and one of the things that's particularly fun about it is the whole aspect of it where um, I get to address all of these interesting themes and do them in such a way that they're not uh, that they're not small you know making everything kind of feel bigger and more uh, interesting as I work and that's been kind of cool for me is to sort of um, be able to take that that angle with everything that track with everything because I think that um, 
I think that what's important for any good hero story and any story where you're you're dealing with the idea and the subject of heroism is to sort of make you know make it a not non cynical but then rich enough in the grand pulp tradition so that people can uh, can really get behind it and so it's been kind of cool to really get to do something that's not cynical with this stuff. And I think we've all probably had our fill of cynicism in this day and age, so I think we're ready to rock. Although, I don't know if there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's ever a time where, I think satire is always good, but I don't think there's ever a time when cynicism isn't something that we're all good on. So yeah, so when I'm working on this story, it's kind of cool because this is sort of Laurel getting her, her sneak peek at, uh, at our boy with his mask off, but we're not going to get to see his face. And I had a huge discussion, we'll call it a discussion, but I had a, <laughs> what's a discussion, but I had a big conversation with my wife about, um, about showing, uh, Nosfero's face, which is, um, which is known to me and understood and, uh, sketched out. And we were discussing whether or not it should be revealed in this issue or if people should wait. She was arguing that um, very effectively that to show his face in the first issue is a little bit too much and I told her I go well depending on how the first issue goes you know sales wise and everything I was like going um, you know you never know is there gonna be a second issue of this book you know do I wanna get everything out of my out of my system here in terms of if I never get to do it again um, you know which I'd like to think is uh, not gonna be the case but you never know um, but it's like I, you know do I want to make sure that I show things and she was saying well you know you want to make sure that you're approaching it from a standpoint of well what if you do and I've always sort of relied on my imagination when it comes to that. Like, oh, I'll, there's so much more to know about this character and there's so much more to do. But it is it is a concern. So again, I'd be curious from you guys what you think about that. Is that something to where you're like, nah, I don't want to see his face in the first book. Wait a little bit. You know, don't, uh, don't show that right away. So who knows? Let me know, guys, in the chat if you've got a thought on that. Um, because, you know, obviously when you come up with something, you're excited to show it to people, but then story-wise, it's like, uh, does it work best for the story? You know, who's to say? I mean, the way that Nosfero works is that, um, I can talk about his face, and I can, you know, show you what led to his face having to be under a mask, and what the ritual was. So all that's going to be in the story. So it's not like you're not going to know anything about him, but there's that that question, you know, it's like when is it too soon to show it? So yeah. That's one of those things, guys. It's one of those things that I have to make sure I'm thinking about. And when we're in, you know, let's see. I'd say keep it hidden but depends on the book's length. That's right. Oh. <laughs> Admiral Wackass has always got my back. Hail, brother. I appreciate that. You know what's so funny is? Is that um, I've been watching a lot of Razor Fist's uh, Shadow Pulp stuff lately. And his, his kind of explanation and discussion of how the author really dealt with... Um, dealt with Lamont Cranston's, you know, backstory and secret identity. And is it really a secret identity? Like, it's just insane. And I think about that stuff a lot. And for me, you know, it's it's one of those things to where, um, and this is the weirdest connection to draw. But I remember watching, and I don't think it would be like this, but I remember watching um, G.I. Joe. And when you got to G.I. Joe the movie and you got your first glimpse of Cobra Commander's face, and you thought, wow, I mean, who knew? So yeah, you're right. No, it's it's you're totally right. And that's what, that's what her argument was, is she goes, do you remember, you know, how much it, how, how disappointing would it have been if you saw Darth Vader's face completely in the first, you know, movie, first Star Wars movie? It's a really good point. You don't see his face. You see the back of his head in the second movie. Now, 
there's enough interest going on around the character to where you're asking questions, and I've got no problem with, with building us up to that. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it is a writing issue. I think that's why what she said sort of stuck with me so much, is that she, she presented it as a, a writing, you know, situation. She was like going, I don't think that's going to make the story, you know, I can tell his origin story without showing his face, not to mention, you know, it makes him much more uh, compelling to her, you know, as she's watching him. You know, she's like, oh, I'm about to see his face. Like, I can see the back of his head, his mask is off. And it's like, no, you're not. And, you know, that's going to intensify her curiosity. And I have, like to think that, you know, if she sees it, it's kind of like, oh, the magic is gone. So, you know, that's that's a really good point, you know. That's a really good point, Admiral Wackass. I appreciate that. So for those of you guys listening on your, uh, on the, you know, while you're at work, let me just make sure I say this. So, Admiral Wackass said, I'd keep it hidden, but depends on the book's length, and if you are uh, you think you're doing two based on sales. I'd lean towards not showing it, because I want to know Sparrow 2, very kind to say. And then the other one was, uh, wherever you feel has the most impact, story is optimal. Absolutely dead on. Definitely, uh, here's more from Admiral Wackass, definitely, Vader is good as a good example. The suit made us want to know more. Um, same with the Emperor, made him more imposing. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So yeah, I mean, I, that is, you're right, that's where I'm leaning at the moment, is it's, it's um, you know, obviously I know I've got the story kind of mapped out now and what's going to happen, and the introduction to char these characters, and I've laid enough, you know, put down enough breadcrumbs, um, you know, for various storylines that are going to be there in the future. And um, I think that that the face reveal will make their relationship and make the audience's relationship with these characters a little bit more um if it's held off on it'll make the relationship deeper and stronger so i think that's kind of probably right on that you know so we'll we'll see as it goes you guys will have a ringside seat and either way i'm not going to show those particular you know pages here on a stream which is what makes uh some of the work um, it's sort of the challenge of streaming and, and doing painting streams and art streams is I don't want to give away certain pages that I'm working on for the story. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta always figure out a way to balance it out. And so that's kind of the, that's the fun thing though, too, about it. That's the challenge. You guys are seeing it. You know, I know there's a lot of pages that Ethan keeps in, not to compare myself to Ethan, of course, but, um, there's a lot of pages that Ethan keeps in reserve when he's working and, uh, they're story pages. And I was on a, um, I was watching, <laughs> last night, I did a, um, I did a deep dive, I was up having insomnia and doing artwork, insomnia is practically at this point, might as well be my religion, um, but I was up late at night and I was working out a couple of, of things on the story, and then I asked myself, I was like, how long have I been, been, you know, known Ethan and been doing, you know, buy, backing CG books and all that kind of thing? And so I just went back in, you know, his YouTube history to sort of look at some of the videos and things. And I mean, it, it blew my mind. I was like, man, I go back to 2018. So I've been watching these streams for a while and, you know, making artwork and, and all this sort of stuff. And um, I know some of you guys probably go back further, but it was, it did give me, me pause for a minute to sort of think, wow, like I've been watching, you know, I'm going to do my update sketch for, you know, the new design or the design of the new, you know, Salamandroid or Cyberfrog. And it's crazy, you know, you guys have watched the birth of this comic and watched the, um, the funding of it. And I wonder what stories, you know, knock on wood, God willing, we'll be telling uh, about, you know, this, this journey with this character in the future. It's pretty damn cool. And uh, I am just... If there's one thing I can say um, with absolute certainty is you guys have been on our mind. Uh, we've talked a lot about you, my wife and I, when I've been uh, working and how grateful we are for you guys. So, much love. Much love. Hey, what's up, Rich? How you doing? Hail to the chat, indeed. I hope you're having a good afternoon, morning, evening, or night, depending on where you find yourself in this world. Hey, what up, Rich? So, doing some work on Nosfero and get myself back on stream. Had a glorious, uh, 
evening just to uh, glimpse at what my typical day is like. I had a glorious evening doing parent-teacher conferences with my high school. There was my two kids. And uh, yeah, it's the, it's the other side of this whole thing. And so, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been just, you know, deep diving into pulp and thinking about, you know, all of the, the things that are going to be in this book, all of the visuals, character design, creature design, which is, which is always one of those things, right? Because you want to, um, you want to have certain things that you keep in your back pocket to reveal, you know? Oh, awesome. That's right. New England, baby. So yeah, here's a funny one for you. So, um, I was watching... Who was on the stream? I was watching uh, Patrick Thomas Parnell on um, on uh, Lord Crackhead and uh, OC Steve's uh, show the other night, and it's always really funny to me. Lord Crackhead, if you're out here, no, I love you, brother. Um, but it's always really funny because I'm watching you know people try to pronounce my name right, and the thing about my name is like, and this is like me with other people's names. Once I worry about it and get it wrong, it's like. I, I'm always like, oh man, am I pronouncing it wrong? And I psych myself out trying to pronounce people's names. And then I realized something funny when I was watching the stream. I go, the reason why, what, how I, what I got to make sure I say to Lord Crackhead next time uh, he's on stream or if he's catching this later is, I have not explained to him how to pronounce my name like a New Englander. So New Englanders in the house, you're going to understand what I mean. But my name is Shanf. And if you're in New England, my name is... Seanth. Yo, what's up, Seanth? Seanth, how you doing, Seanth? That's how you pronounce my name in New England. So for those of you guys... <laughs> so for Rich and my other New Englanders out there, that's how it's done, baby. That's how you do it. That's my name spoken in New England. By my boys. So let's see here. Nice. All right, let's see what we got here. So yeah, I've been just checking out a lot of really, um, a r lot of really cool stuff and doing some drawing. Yeah, you know what's so funny is it, um, is it Ayala? Is that how I pronounce it? Ayala? I'm just curious. Let me know if I'm wrong in the chat. So yeah, Rich says, uh, <laughs> laugh out loud, good stuff. Had a hard time pronouncing my last name for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, tsh. shoot, I mean, I, I would not have pronounced my name if it wasn't mine. It's like, uh, it's definitely a weird one. There you go. Yeah, see, I mean, it's, when you're a New Englander, um, there's certain names you come across. I can assure you, one of the names you don't come across is Shanth. Like, you don't see that very often anywhere. I haven't seen that very often in India, for heaven's sake. Um, but you do, you come off, uh, across, like, you know, certain names and certain things that you hear a lot of, and so pronunciation gets a lot easier. But my name is difficult to pronounce no matter where you're from, because you just, you're not going to meet another Shanth. Uh, I haven't yet, and, you know, I've been doing this for 45 years, I've been having this name, so. There we go. Let's get her face mapped in. And that's the thing, too, about, um, the thing about Pulp and the thing about these kinds of stories, and I want this story to be a, a very rich, fun kind of Pulp adventure story. The thing about it is, is that, um, when you're doing this stuff, is that, the, there's the beauty of the female characters, right? There's the, the deepness of sort of the themes and the richness of the storytelling. But um, but when you're doing this kind of work, there's this um, there's this uh, philosophical um, there's this philosophical quality and this important anchoring to good versus evil that's not simplified, but that is is true. It has integrity to it. That's important, and the same thing goes for for beautiful. Oh, there you go. Nice. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so is, is it is it pronounced um, Sean? Is that how it's pronounced? Let me know, Admiral Wackass. Admiral Wackass says, I have a buddy, um, Sean, I'm going to pronounce it, S-H-A-N, who's uh, Pakistani. Very cool, man. Yeah, we got, we all got our, see, that's the crazy thing about it, right? We've all got our crews from everywhere. That's, that's the reality of it, you know, is that we're living in a time where, oh, awesome, Admiral Wackass says, yes, Eric the Guapo, what's up? What is up? See? Yep. That's, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's a wild, it's a wild thing, you know? It's a wild thing with pronunciations. Eric the Guapo, what is up? 
Would you say, Eric Zaguapo, that you have a plethora of pinatas? To quote my favorite line from uh, the Three Amigos there. Let's see, we've got, all right. Yeah, everybody's giving their love to uh, Eric the Guapo there in the chat. Good to see it. Good to see that we're uh, <laughs> that we are who we say we are. A cool group of people who just want to be entertained and support quality stuff. Imagination is our currency. And um, one of the things I was thinking about last night, because uh, I was thinking about imagination last night a lot. I was thinking about. I saw an old interview with uh, George Lucas. And uh, George Lucas was talking about um, was talking about imagination, with, and he said, um, you know, there's there's people who who don't have an imagination, and it's really weird when you when you meet that. And something my wife and I were talking about about why we why we feel this instant connection with people who love fantasy and love fantasy art, and it's because you have to. It takes a a lot of discipline and a huge imagination to create fantasy, but it takes a very, very good grounding in in imagination in order to be able to just enjoy fantasy. So when somebody sees these books and sees the fantasy work that I'm doing and they back it, I know like they have they understand this whole imagination thing. And it's the same thing if they, you know, were, you know, inspired by Star Wars or inspired by comics. It's like a shorthand for us. We all know it's like, oh okay, yeah, so you have an imagination you're able to go places you know and think about worlds and places you've never been you know oh my god yeah yeah absolutely eric the guapo says yes i would consider the current what if series to be evidence of a huge lack of imagination that's right because um imagination is imagination is something that can't be done by committee and in fact, anyone who would want to try to do it by committee is probably lacking in imagination. But the interesting aspect of that is is that imagination is um, is something that when you're in a community of imaginative people, it's like it's an accelerant on imagination. So for me, you know, when I've got you guys who have my back and who get it and are supporting the work that I'm doing. The thing that's that's sort of cool about it is it's an accelerant for me when I see other artists. How oh, we got five people in here and only one like? Come on, people, hit that like button. Let's make it happen. But you guys are like an accelerant for my imagination, and it's like, oh, these guys get it. They they know I'm not, you know. And and gosh, do you remember looking for that person who cared about the science fiction and comics that you could have those conversations with? To me, it was just it was oxygen, guys. It was huge. My guy was um, a buddy of mine named Zachary Hartford Cullis. Uh, I do have that tick of remembering people's first, middle, and last names uh, when I was a kid. Worked on it since <laughs> so that my I don't have a neural overload. But that guy introduced me to Warhammer 40K and so many cool things. And uh, I owe a great debt of gratitude to him. Hey, what's up? Chump, how you doing? And uh, it's good to see you. Let's see here. Ironic, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny. It depends on, yeah. It depends on where, uh, where you fall, you know, with him. But I, I happen to think that George Lucas has a really impressive imagination, and I think that um, Walt Disney had an amazing imagination. Jack Kirby off the hook with his imagination. Stan Lee too, for that matter. But it's, it's kind of funny because when you think about it when we're critiquing imagination and like in terms of in the in the way that we do in the cool way you know it's um it's it's huge man i mean it's it's like we i was watching so i was watching razor fist uh the shadow cast and he was talking about a book he loved and he was kind of like laying into it because i feel like everything i'm saying right now is negative because but it's i love it so much all i can do is nitpick it and i thought that was hilarious and wonderful at the same time so this is how, you know, we get her where she needs to be. So Eric the Guapo says, um, the Warhammer universe is intriguing to me. I have not delved into it, but I do plan on it one day. So exactly. So my buddy was into it and he showed me a lot of it, but I never got into it beyond watching him paint miniatures, which he was amazing at. 
and then him giving me miniatures to paint and hanging out. But yeah, I want to delve into that world. I watched the fan film that was done, I think, in... I'm not sure if it was done in Blender, but I watched that great fan film that people did about it, and I thought it was incredible. Yeah, that world is really rich and stunning and cool, and I just know it from the uh, the covers of the boxes because I was a big, a big uh, science fiction fantasy fan and loved, you know, all that stuff, so... I responded chiefly to the art. That was the big place in which I responded the most. So yeah, we gotta make we gotta make Laurel sort of be that thing that that you know is is you know changing this guy's this guy's you know he shifts the way that his dedication works because one of the things that I always say is is interesting about guys and um, what they find attractive in, in women, and I don't want to speak for all of you here, but this has been my experience, particularly in fiction, is that every guy is, is kind of looking for a woman who sees something in him that maybe he, he hopes is there or that is there, and uh, it's really all in the eyes. You know, whether it's your potential or your goodness or you know, your decency, the things that you don't think about yourself as much. And Nosfero kind of sees himself as irredeemably fallen, even though he does the right thing. And she's got the kind of spiritual purity to where she's able to see what he is. And that's something that's misunderstood in characters a lot of times. Eric Guapo says, I'm currently obsessed with an image series called Rumble. Perhaps once I uh, have finished that, I might set my sights on Warhammer. Very, very good point. And I think that um, one of the things that's misunderstood about modern storytelling and um, adventure storytelling is what that sort of interplay is and what the dynamic is between certain characters. And for me, the female character in this story and often capable um, of doing this in life is giving, giving sort of fuel to that why of why we're doing it. And you're absolutely right. Yeah, thank you, Admiral Akas. Admiral Akas says that's a great dynamic, and it's true. You've got this character who's like, he's all about the, you know, he's about the job, and the job is fighting evil. And he sees himself as being, you know, because of the ritual that he went through and what it has unlocked in him, he sees himself as being this it's funny he's doing the right things but he sees himself as irredeemable and he's fighting like a person who doesn't think he belongs in the world he's fighting for and that's both a plus and a minus for him so let me see here oh yeah Gru comics are great uh is it uh is it aragones i hope i'm pronouncing his name right i could be wrong um but uh yeah roach ball uh rich uh, ayala says um i'm currently collecting uh, Groot, uh, Groot Comics. God, my reading is terrible. And then, uh, Aaron says, um, Warhammer 40k overall lore is mind-blowing and crazy with the amount of books out there. I know I've barely, uh, scratched the surface. Yeah, I started listening to, um, a friend of mine re recommended that I read the, um, The Witcher book series because he said it was just great out there pulp. And I want to listen to some audiobooks of Warhammer 40k for sure. So yeah, I mean it's 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 an interesting thing when you really care about these characters and you know you're you're drawing them and obviously I I you know care about these characters a great deal. Thinking about like what does it take? Let me move this. Sorry, I've got some reference material in front of me here, so I got to move it here. There we go. What's it going to take? You know, for this character, I'll move the camera a little bit to make my life easier there. Um, but what are the what are the motivations? What are the whys of this character? And I'm one of those people who, in storytelling and in fiction, I've always loved. Um, one of my favorite bits of storytelling is I've always loved the interplay of the sexes in comics, whether it's uh, Betty and Bruce in the Peter David Hulk series, or uh, Spider-Man and Mary Jane during the um, David uh, Michelini or Michelini, depending on how I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, Spider-Man series and they weren't trying to have the same job and I think that that's something that is incredibly boring when you have the male and female characters basically trying to excel at the same things and there is something really 
beautiful at that I don't know that if it's it's articulated well enough and if um, a lot of young women out there even understand the power of this but that when men find a woman who believes in them and sees their their potential how much we dedicate ourselves to achieving that potential like we're not looking for somebody who is going to deep down we're not looking for somebody my guess i mean again i want to speak for the you know the entire sex here you know but it's like it's i think we know when 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 someone just will accept our half-assed attempts it's it's even if we can get away with it, it's not satisfying at all. We want somebody who um, sees our potential and believes that excellence should be expected of us. And that's what she does for him. She looks at him and she thinks, you know, look at this guy. First of all, the first time I met him, he saved my life. So that's where what I know him from and that has revealed more about his character than watching him on any other day he takes the fact that he does that for granted and in doing so he's not putting fuel in his tank because he he takes it for granted and she's saying if you've done that what else might you be capable of and maybe uh, you know maybe you're my answer in this world Maybe you're my other half. And that's something, that's a kind of personal um, fulfillment and a personal saving, if you will, um, that you have to kind of do for yourself at the end of the day. You have to find the things that, that matter to you, and then you have to also believe in order to pursue them full out, you have to think that you deserve them, but also think you're not entitled to them. And that's, that's a really big... There's a huge differentiation there. And it's very, very difficult, I think, sometimes for people to to balance those two things out, you know? Yeah, so Eric DeGuapo says, um, that male and female dynamic is a primal thing in all of us and can very, easy, um, and can very easily relate to it. Uh, it is a great way to draw people in to be invested into characters. You're absolutely right. You know, I remember, and, and it was funny because the story was so atypical, but I remember watching the movie As Good As It Gets, and uh, she says, I want you to give me a really good compliment right now at the restaurant, or I'm leaving. And Jack Nicholson says, um, you make me want to be a better man. And I thought, that's some good writing right there. And um, and, th and that was not a movie that was, was putting things out there in a very... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't a movie that was overly anything. You know, it was it was it was a pretty raw movie. Like there's a part where he's a, a famous author of fiction, and he gets stopped by an editor in the office, and and he's asked, uh, "How do you write women so well?" And he goes, "Simple. I just think of a man, and I take away reason and accountability." And so that line of dialogue, "You make me want to be a better man," is in the same movie, and that's the amazing thing about writing to me, is thinking about those moments where these characters are not simplified they're just not simplified and I'm somebody who you know I've always told my wife it's like I I was really interested in girls from an early age but I mean in a real like I was like I want to get married I, I get it like when I was on the playground as a kid guys would be like ah girls are yucky and stupid and I would be like yeah you're right you guys go over there Get away from those ugly, stupid girls. I'll hold them off. <laughs> and I remember when I met my wife in college, and I was like, yep, that's the one for me. That's it, you know. It's, it wasn't my first rodeo, and I knew that this one was uh, was a keeper. And so when I think about Nosferu, and I think about... It, this is also relates to how these stories are really, really good for, you know, young men and even for older men to, to look at and learn a little bit about um, how this this whole thing can work, you know? And I think that that's the, the biggest thing in the world that I've been realizing more and more as time has kind of gone on, is that um, you have to learn at some point. Someone has to teach you and explain to you the basics of how you, you know, how relationships work. 
And I think there's been a huge, um, there's been a huge lacking of that. Like if you don't have any guys in your life who can help you to understand how women work, um, because it's not something that, you know, is, is easy to have explained, you know, like what is, what is it about being a guy that, that is interesting to them? Then it's a pretty tough, you know, hill to climb. And, and some of us have climbed that hill, but it's still, it's a lot, you know? And, uh, I think our fiction and my, the fiction I read as a kid really kind of, uh, helped me to understand it. I mean, a lot of it I got from comics, you know, when I would see, um, you know, and that's one of the great sort of frustrating things for me about the direction Spider-Man went in, but I saw Mary Jane and Peter Parker as a happily married couple when I was younger, and both strong in their own way and both supportive in their own way, but there was theirs wasn't a perfect marriage. They had things that they had to work on, and you got a side sort of, uh, you got a bird's eye view and you got a front row seat, I should say, to watching them sort it out. And it's because the writers, and the writer in that case, was wise. He had wisdom to pass on about relationships. And I wonder, you know, about that a lot, like the the kind of uh, vacuum of wisdom in that particular way that we're experiencing right now. Something to think about. And, um, you know, like, what is it... What You know, we could talk about that with Star Wars, but what is it in Star Wars that made, uh, made Princess Leia be attracted to Han Solo? It wasn't because uh, he did whatever she wanted. And it wasn't because she told him whatever he wanted to hear. He had to work. He had to sort of become worthy of excellence. And in a lot of ways, he had to sacrifice himself in the, um, you know, or, or she had to watch him, you know, sort of have his integrity tested. And, and in a lot of ways, the sequences in Empire Strikes Back where you see him being tortured is basically reducing him down to his lowest point to where you can see what he's really made of. And when Lando comes in and says, he's not even interested in you, he's after somebody called Skywalker, he kind of wakes up and gets angry for his friend, even though he's in you know, utter peril. And I think that that kind of showed her a lot of who he was. It wasn't just that she was watching him go through a tough time. He he, you know, was flirty and he put himself out there to her. But at the end of the day, you know, when she said, I love you, and he said, I know, that worked because it was exciting for everybody. It understood that dynamic. That dynamic between men and women. It's a very cool dynamic. It is absolutely and utterly, in the most beautiful way, fraught. <laughs> it's fraught with a lot to navigate and a lot to try to figure out. But it is, it is what our it's part of our, our thing here you know it's part of the human experience and we got to uh rather than run from it we've kind of got to we got to come to at least come to some place with it some understanding of it and that's been kind of what it is and now we have tinder yeah which is it's kind of an amazing thing isn't it it's um it's one of those things to where um it's a really great um a lot of those things are interesting to me because they they seem like they I've met a lot of people, including, funny enough, um, my mother-in-law, who have who've met people online, you know, and um, and had a positive experience. I don't know if it wasn't on Tinder, let me be clear, but it was, um, you know, there. <laughs> but it's it's an interesting thing because what you sort of get when you get um, why is it that when you have um, Why is it that when you remove certain aspects of the game that it makes the game less fulfilling? Why is a game defined so much, or I should say, and even the life experience defined by the limitations, by the rules, by the boundaries? And how come when you make something where you take away too many rules or too many um, obstacles, it becomes less engaging? I could think about that all day, you know, what, what that's about. And I think one of the weirdest... Um, cultural phenomenon that we've seen happen, you know, is this, um, this whole kind of, uh, 
well, if, if it's too hard for somebody, let's find a way to make it easier. And what's funny is it doesn't seem like it makes people happier. I'm blown away by that because to me, when I was a kid, I always thought, well, if I had it easier, I'd be happier. Uh, so, okay, so that was Admiral Wack, as said, and now uh, we have Tinder. And then Eric DeGuapo says, very great point. That is why I believe indie creators are much more important than corporatized stuff. Passing down wisdom and values in the form of storytelling is how we... Um, is how I guess we're gonna say. Um, oh, sorry. Is how our cultural our culture survive? Yes, absolutely. Again, apologies for my reading there. Um, it's you're right, and it's it's also when we talk about these things, and we talk about again, you know, things like you know heroism and and other aspects of this. There's really no reason for those things um, for us to value those things. Uh, other than there's this sort of primal need, like this, this, or this primal acknowledgement that these things have value. Let's try it from that standpoint. And so when I look at this stuff, and Admiral Wackass says absolutely to Eric Guapo, and I think that's a really, really good point. And so for me, when I'm, I'm looking at this stuff, I guess the place that I'm going to always end up with it is, is that, um, That's a good way of putting this. When I think about why that stuff matters, I think there's two things that happen when you see excellence out in this world. The people who have imagination, but also the people who have humility and are humble, see excellence and it inspires them and they admire it and they know how to support and applaud it without feeling slighted that it's not about them. I know I fall into this category. I can be, I'm genuinely, genuinely thrilled when I see people, other people doing well. But I think that there is this, um, this more unhealthy kind of, uh, of experience or type of mind that comes from a, a certain amount of self-obsession and everything else that sees beauty, integrity, honor, courage, all of those sort of heavenly virtues and feels instant resentment, feels a bit of shame maybe and then feels this instant sort of resentment because it's like, I could be doing, and it's, I think in a weird way, it's this knowledge that I could be doing better and I'm not, or there's some awareness there clearly or else people wouldn't care. And I think that, that independent creators need to make sure they're brave in that regard and independent, frankly, you know, comic book backers who are really, you know, being the, the sort of evangelists of imagination right now. Saying, hey, look, we are here. We're not what you, we say, you know, what you say we are. We believe in imagination. Show us imagination. Show us a rich, fulfilling, deep, and rewarding optimism. Because we need it. It's like oxygen. And that's, that's what it is for me. Sometimes when I'm painting eyes, what you'll see me do is I'll make the pupils a little bit too big and then sort of pair, or make the whites of the eyes a little too big and then pair them down. It's kind of an editing process that I'll do because the eyes are so, so important, you know, when I'm working. Like getting, especially a woman's eyes, are really important. Um, and uh, I try to get a soulfulness into, you know, the guy's eyes as well, but. Um, the look that she is giving him is the look that we have to understand as being the look of, you know, seeing his potential, seeing his commitment, and seeing it in a way that he himself is unable to see it. And um, that's really it. I mean, how other people, if other people, <laughs> sounds may sound obvious. Other people are really important to us um, in terms of our friends and the people we're close to for the way that they can see some of our qualities that we ourselves can't. And um, there's nothing, you know, like having those people around you who know when you're on track to help you and to, to help you see those things, those qualities in yourself and let you know, you know, again, when you're, when you're off track, you know, and the people closest to you are the best positions to help you with that. There we go. And I'll be adjusting a lot of this stuff too as well, but, you know, getting it, Getting it roughed in is important at this stage. There we go. 
and when you do the right thing no one can uh, no one really notices or cares either you just have to build that muscle over and over despite it being easier now than ever uh, to fail into shame resentment and regret that's from Admiral Wackass that's absolutely spot on yeah you're absolutely right it is and and that's the thing that that really fascinates me is that we fortify that in ourselves with the fiction, with the things we consume. It's that uh, that quote that the soul becomes dyed with the color of its thoughts. Uh, I think that was um, Marcus Aurelius. I could be wrong, um, but uh, do do check me on that if uh, if I'm off there. It could be Epictetus. I'm not sure, but I think about that sometimes. It's true. The soul does become dyed with the color of its thoughts. So what food are we putting in our minds? I'm not interested in poisoning anybody's mind with my artwork. I'm interested in um, inspiring people and I think that's what a lot of us and that's what that's what inspiration and imagination has done for me if you don't see a noble thing in your everyday life you can see a noble thing in fiction and it can guide you in the right path you can be grounded in whatever you know spirituality or I should say you know religion or whatever you know that that is speaking to you and you can get it there if you don't get it anywhere else. And it can it can inspire you, can lift you up. And I think about that a lot. You know, I think about how important that is to um, to have that inspiration around as a, you know, you know, in fiction or anything else. You need examples. Oh, good. Aurelius. I was right. So Admiral Wackass says, Aurelius, I haven't read all of his meditations, but it's great. Yeah, I've, I've been listening to the um, a YouTube video audio book of it and it's it's been really great and um i think yeah i think that kind of stuff is just really important to have in the back of our our heads right guys i mean you're thinking and this is you know psych 101 or cognitive behavioral therapy 101 there's so many different things that have have utilized these kinds of teachings but your thoughts drive your feelings and how we're you know how we're thinking is really important and what we put in our head is really important and while you know every now and again right we get addicted to the you know the intensity and the the joy of of outrage or you know emotion it's really at the end of the day it's our thoughts that are driving our emotion and so when we hear stuff that's inspiring and hopeful and optimistic it's amazing the impact it can have i mean jordan peterson had a huge impact on me um from uh you know, when I was, I saw a lecture that I think he gave in England that was about the 12 rules for life. And uh, I was hearing about the guy and I, and I honestly did not hear any of the negative things about him. I was just seeing like, oh, wow, this guy's, you know, a lot of people responding to what he has to say. Sounds a little bit like um, the reaction people were having to Joseph Campbell. And then when I heard what he was saying and the things he was talking about, which were incredibly you know relevant to me and where I was I was just like this is amazing and I think that that really kind of helps us as you know as human beings when you hear somebody articulate that and you can see really quickly you can learn a lot about people by how intensely they react to that kind of thing and how angry it makes them you go and I think it's important to ask the question why is this person or why is this why is this message making people so angry and it's it's because they believe in the opposite and I'm not nihilistic I just I can't live there so I actually uh, believe in people and I believe in um, making the most we can out of the time we have and that's why I bothered you know and, and actually I should say I really don't think I had a choice I was so passionate about trying to understand this whole art thing I just couldn't stop drawing but it's why I've put the time into this thing you know, getting good at artwork and, and, and learning how to draw and paint when it, it's been tough, when it's been a lot of work, it's because I believe in it and it's important to me. And it's nice to hear people talk about not doing the easy thing, you know, always, but doing the thing that you know is right that you're supposed to be doing. And, um, or that you know, you know, deep down you're supposed to be doing. And that's what this is, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, I don't always know exactly why, but I just, I know it. It's what I'm supposed to be doing. I care about people. I care about beauty. And I, I guess maybe if I were to try to intellectualize it, which I'm really loath to do, um, the thing I would say is is that 
I can very much understand and appreciate it from the standpoint of fictional stories and comics were a tremendous help to me in my life. And uh, it, it saddens me to think of, um, while people have the old stories, it saddens me to think of how much of culture is so... Um, was it whatever the opposite of life affirming is it is life denying i guess we would say or life rejecting and i think that uh myself included but we could all use some artwork that um that is life affirming i think that's important stephen rockwood oh thank you stephen rockwood i appreciate that thank you my artist brother um I, yeah, I care about the line, you know, I care about, you know, drawing lines and I care about aesthetics, I care about beauty, and, um, you know, I remember whenever I paint a female figure, people, people always tell me it reminds me of, of, you know, it reminds them of their, of my wife and things like that, but I'll tell you this, um, oh, I'm glad to hear that, Admiral Wackass says, so Stephen Rockwood says, I'm, you're doing great work here, Jonathan, to that I say, I appreciate it. Admiral Wackass says, I always feel like your streams help my head in the right place, dude. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and that's really one of my many goals for these streams, you know, is to, to help people to kind of, you know, recenter themselves and, and reconnect with all those great things that are inside of them and the things that um, inspire them. Because I think that um, I remember the people who've had, you know, helped me do that. And I, I just want to make sure I'm... You know, if, if I can do that with these streams and if that's what comes out of it, then that's to me like winning the lottery. So I do appreciate that a lot. Um, really do. There we go. Yeah, I mean, but when I look at this character and I'm drawing them, I remember the first time I saw a girl that I had a crush on. And um, I remember just the way that she looked in the light and you know it was kindergarten or first grade you know those kinds of moments and you know the sun's coming in through the classroom window you know and, and that's that's a very powerful thing when you're a kid you know those things are huge and and i like to celebrate that stuff because it's the funny part of being a person it's the funny part of being a human being and uh we all have those moments and we all have those things that we can recall every now and again my glasses will slide down and i'll realize i'm not seeing things in focus as much as i want to so um, always makes for a funny process for me. There we go. It's hard not to get your Bob Ross voice going when you're painting. It's one of those things. But yeah, guys, I mean, it's 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 everything, you know. I mean, it's it's everything for me to um, to make sure that we're we're championing art and we're championing all of these um, these really cool things that are out there that. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom out there that we can reconnect with and connect with. Scottsley. Oh, hey, how you doing, Scottsley? Good to see you. Hey, everyone, how's it going? Uh, it's going pretty well for me. How's it going for you, brother? Going okay? Let us know in the chat. Um, but yeah, we're just talking about myth and fantasy and fiction and honor and pulp and, you know, that amazing, that amazing mystery and magic that is... Uh, uh, the ladies and uh, yeah, it's going good for us. I hope it's going good for you And I hope you're having a good uh, morning afternoon evening or night depending on where you're located brother Doing well, all right good stuff Absolutely my friend I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I mean it's um oh afternoon there excellent. It's um yeah, it's it's a very it's a very cool thing for me, you know. Like I remember, um, I remember reading, you know, comics and and looking at fiction and seeing, you know, how it affected me and seeing how important it was. And I remember the first time I met somebody who, in in real life, really demonstrated and showed some kind of integrity. And um, when you see people. When you see people, you know, like that, it really affects you deeply, you know. And um, I thought, well, I want to be like that. And you could wonder why that is. Like, I wonder about that sometimes. Like, <laughs> what made me see somebody and go, well, that person has integrity. I want to be like them one day. But, yeah, it, uh, it was definitely a thing that happened. 
So for anybody who's catching this later, just want to make sure I say this. Um, this is um, this is no sphere of the Crypt Walker. This is currently funding on Indiegogo. Your support would be greatly appreciated. And if you already have backed the book, I appreciate that so much. There's some new secret. Uh, there's some new add-on perks I should mention, which is Art Book One and Two has been made available as an add-on um, to um, several of the Nosferro packages because some people wanted to buy um, the head sketch tier and then also get those art books. But yeah, mythology is um, Scottsley. My mythology is my my absolute favorite subject and uh, area of inquiry in the world. You know, I mean, it's it's. It's art, it's mythology, it's storytelling, it's fairy tales, it's all that stuff. And when everybody's working today and when everybody's out there, I want us to kind of, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there that is, that can help us or can, can shove us, push us, or encourage us off of any kind of uh, optimistic path we might be trying to be on. And what I always say is, when you see it and it's going on, recenter yourself and get yourself back in to the stream of reminding yourself what are the things you do believe in what are the things you love one of my favorite things I used to do as a teacher that I you know still think works on people is I'd go into a room full of college students and I would say I want you to tell me everything that you hate like just quickly volunteer and it was amazing the room would just flood with people talking and then I would say all right now I want you guys to uh, to tell me everything that you love, and there was dead silence. People were so um, our reflex is so well honed uh, towards cynicism without us even knowing it, and that's huge. You know, we got to get the good stuff in there. We got to remind ourselves of it. So Scotty says, uh, "I love me some mythology as a storyteller," um, and I gosh, I can't pronounce that. The um, is it the Edas? Is that it? Um, and Greek mysteries are my uh, bread and butter. Excellent. So yeah, I that for me, the Greeks, uh, Greek mythology had a huge impact on me. I've actually got, um, you know, um, the Iliad and uh, gosh, what else? And the Odyssey actually over in the next room, leather bound, because I like to have those books to remind me of that kind of stuff. You know, to it just feels like it's a. I don't know. It's weird owning books to me, and it's the same thing with these books I make for that matter. Um, when people buy one of my books and back one of my books, it's like you're, it's like something you're taking. When I buy a book, it's like I'm taking something and putting it into the bookshelf of my mind. And everything I buy and back and, and support, I'm, I'm bringing into my house and I'm also putting it out there into my, my, my brain. Like I'm kind of owning it. And that's the thing that, that makes it such a, uh, a pleasure that you guys are, are backing and supporting this book. But also I, I, appreciate what a big deal it is or what a honor it is is the best way I could think to put it um, in your bookshelf and there's this really great quote I like that was um, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's a Latin quote of uh, in scientia veritas in arte um, honestas forgive my Latin and it's in um, science truth in art honor and I I always think about that is I don't think that just because I sit down and make artwork I'm doing something honorable. I, I see that as a bar that I want to shoot towards, you know, is I want to try to be worthy of the, the skill and the profession that I'm working in, you know, be worthy of, of this thing. And I think there's that, that humility is, is just something that really, you know, in that respect for the pursuit is something I really uh, enjoy and admire. Helps me to kind of um, see it all as, as much less of a grind and much more of a um as a pursuit as a passion and as a responsibility and that's the cool stuff right there and so yeah when i saw nosfero uh crossed 9k and that was enormous to me like i was i was like wow and it just keeps going so um thank you guys again for getting the word out and for your support and i that's one of the reasons why i was saying to myself i gotta keep doing more streams because um Got to keep getting the word out. So there's the painting aspect of this. And then there's the um, the promotion aspect. So I try to switch on and off in terms of, um, or switch gears a little bit. So even though I'm painting right now, um, sometimes I have to go into just that purely art place. And it's hard to do the creative stuff completely on camera. But it's fun. So Scottsy says, so true. 
It's easy to stand up against something you hate, but hard to stand for something you love. And it's absolutely true because cynicism is so, um, there's a quality to, um, to questioning things, which is important, right? It's, it's important to test our theories, test our ideas, but they have to be done in a, um, with, with sort of, um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for here in an honest fashion. So a good faith discussion as opposed to a bad faith discussion so when somebody starts out with you know isn't it all just bullshit that's that's not really uh it's not really a a honest or a good faith discussion but when somebody starts to actually try to you know say hey so tell me why, why do you think about that or why do you like that versus this and that they, they're really curious you'll find even if they disagree with a lot of the stuff that you're saying that you come out the other side richer and it takes a lot of work to build those kinds of relationships with you know the audience and artists but also within groups of artists and friends is to kind of realize that you know you don't always get to understand everything that somebody's doing um, artistically but that you can grow from seeing it and that's the cool thing you know like I, I see artists who do things I can't imagine doing or choices I wouldn't necessarily make um, but I think up oh, construction's working out in front of my house here but i think that um that that it, it inspires me nonetheless because i don't need to see myself mirrored in every single thing i see i actually need to see um i need to see lighthouses and i need to see you know things that help me to aspire in the direction that i know i'm supposed to be going in and i know is the the one that's going to be the most satisfying and fulfilling sometimes it's the one that's the hardest um and sometimes it's it's not the hardest it's the one that is right in front of you. And right now, um, I think it's a mixture of both. If I were to describe where I'm finding myself at the moment, you know, it's a mixture of both. So, all right, gang, I've got the um, the construction firing up in front of my house, but I just wanted to come in and check in and say, hey guys, if you haven't yet, uh, back no spare the Crypt Walker. We are over 9K, heading towards 10K, and I'm gonna need uh, every bit of, of help I can in getting there and beyond. So. Uh, thank you so much for checking out the stream, everybody. It's uh, always great to have you here if you're at work. I hope you're having a great work day and uh, things are going well for you. And uh, yeah, just remember this, guys. Keep moving towards the light. Keep working. You know, keep striving, as Denzel would say. And uh, let's, let's keep doing what we're doing. Let's remind people of the importance of imagination. Let's support it, foster it, and work to create it every chance we get, guys. I appreciate you so, so much. Uh, let me go through here. So we got Scottsley. Thank you for being here today. Admiral Wackass, thank you for being here today. Stephen Rockwood is always a pleasure. Uh, let's see here. We've got Eric the Guapo. Good to see you in the chat there. Um, Aaron's in here. We've got Rich in here. We've got, uh, let's see who else. We've got uh, Chump who was in here. And let me see if there's anybody else. If I got anybody else in here. I think that is everybody. So thank you guys so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. You guys are great. Yes, hail Scottsley, hail Admiral Wackass, Stephen Rockwood, everybody who's been in the chat today. Uh, much appreciation. Uh, and you guys just keep getting it done, and uh, I'll keep working here. So take care, everybody, and thanks for being here. Uh, talk to you soon, and everybody, please, as always, uh, stay gold. Here's a little something for you busters. Yeah. You're not even learning anything on this beat. Yeah. You think I'm stupid, son? Yeah. See what I'm trying to say to you, boy? Yeah. Do you? What's up with that? Look at me, do it! Y'all cowards don't even smoke crack. What's up with that? You smoke crack, don't you? Y'all cowards don't even smoke crack. Look at me, boy! Hey to you. You smoke crack, don't you? Don't even smoke crack. Do you know what that does to you? Huh? You smoke crack, don't you? you smoke crack. Go on and do it exponentially. What's up with that? It kills your brain cells, son. It kills your brain cells. Don't even smoke crack. No guts, huh? Nosferu is a supernatural hero that is a cross between the Shadow 
Peter Cushing's Abraham Van Helsing, and Lovecraft's Henry Armitage. The lone surviving member of the secret holy order, he is sworn to battle a cult of vampires dedicated to opening the door to the eldritch gods they worship. Striking from his crypt lair deep within an impenetrable mire, Nosfero collects the cult's various grimoire and artifacts in an attempt to learn the means of defeating them. Nosfero underwent the ritualistic binding to the spirit world, wherein members of the secret order have a shard from a holy sword driven through their noses to allow them to access supernatural abilities. One such ability allows Nosfero to summon Phantomus, a giant phantom hound that can travel through the nether to and from any location when needed. With no worldly attachments beyond his devotion to God, Nosfero's world is forever changed when he rescues a beautiful young maiden named Laurel from one of the cult's vile sacrificial rituals. Nosfero the Cryptwalker Volume 1 is my third Indiegogo campaign and will be a fully painted and lavishly illustrated pulp adventure story. Sensational, vivid, and uncompromisingly aspirational storytelling with an edge. Don't miss your chance to back Nosfero the Cryptwalker Volume 1, available for a limited time only on Indiegogo. Kick off! Ain't got nothing! Oh, yeah.